Welcome to the Psychology Is podcast. I am Nick Fortino, and I'm so grateful to be joined today by Dr. David Cohen. Welcome, David. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much for um, asking me to be here with you today. My pleasure. And I'll mention, I know we have many regular listeners of the podcast, and we all, always have new listeners as well. So I'll mention, especially to the regular listeners, that you know they're they're well aware that on this podcast, this here is, I believe, the forty eighth episode, and we have covered many different topics. But lately, and you know, throughout the history of this podcast, we have turned our attention to the topic of modern day mental health care and the paradigms that support it, and specifically some of the problems with modern day practices in psychiatry. And we've had many very critical conversations and, and you know, you are someone that I, I decided to reach out to because I have come across your work and your, your positions on this issue. And I think that you are very insightful on the topic. And to be totally honest with you, sometimes I think that the people who become critics of modern day psychiatry sometimes get framed as fringe type of folks who <clears throat> are not necessarily associated with prestigious institutions or mainstream science in any way. And so to me, it's, it's, it's important that you are associated with UCLA, which is widely regarded as one of the most prestigious institutions in the world and and yet you also have you know these these positions that you have you have your criticisms of modern psychiatric practices that i think tend to counter the common narratives that people are exposed to so for the reason for that reason you know i think that makes you a somewhat unique guest um I mean, we've had other people who are also associated with mainstream prestigious institutions as well. But again, there, there's just no way that anyone could ever frame someone like you as being a sort of fringe conspiracy theorist. Um, <laughs> Except the people who know me well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Let me start by letting you explain to our audience, what is it that you do professionally? Again, thank you for for you know having me here. Really, a pleasure to talk uh, with you and uh, and your listeners. Professionally, um, my main activities are researching, teaching, and university administration at UCLA, at the Luskin School of Public Affairs. I mainly teach graduate social work students, people who um, are obtaining their MSWs or their master's degrees in public policy. Occasionally, we have some nurses that come into our classes, some psychologists, uh, some physicians. So it's people uh, mostly in the allied health sciences is, are the people I teach uh, with, too. Uh, my persistent interests, the things I've researched and written about uh, for about 35 years now as an academician, uh, have been um, medicalization, so the turning of problems into diseases that require medical interventions. They uh, have to do with psychotropic drugs, first the prescription ones, first the antipsychotic ones, and then moving on to all the other different classes of them, the stimulants, the benzodiazepines, the antidepressants, the, the so-called mood stabilizers. And looking, when looking at the drugs, looking at how they were seen you know, conceived, sort of viewed by different players in the mental health system, whether they're those who take them, those who prescribe them, those who sell them, those who write about them, those who are teachers, uh, the, the, the professionals, the medical professionals, the non-medical professionals. So the whole representations of the drugs, how they're seen and used by different players, that's been a lot of my focus. And then I, I did uh, much studying on the adverse effects of the drugs and generally the harms 
that result from mental health interventions. I've looked at drug safety systems. How do you ensure safety of products uh, ranging from drugs to uh, electroshock um, of the people that are going to be subjected to them? I've then looked at um, essentially law and ethics, the tight knot of law, ethics, and power when you're a mental patient and you know, what, what actually runs the show? Is it the values? Is it the laws? Is it that the, the power you're under? What, what holds sway over everything? And how are these all tied together and difficult to unravel when you're in the center of them and tied up in knots by, by ethics or law or, or the power that people wield over you or that you wield over others? Mm -hmm. And so I've been into um, coercion, of course, dilemmas of coercions and systems of care, um, the history of coercion, how we force people to do things we want them to do. Usually we say for your own good and um, and things like that. So these are the interests and, and others because there's no sense going through a list uh, of all the things that I've looked at and try to really understand better. But it's it's around that. It's, um, it's groups in the mental health system uh, that are being subjected to different interventions and the principles and the history of the things are being subjected to. Mm. If only we could explore all of that expertise in one podcast <laughs> episode, but we'll do our best here. And that kind of brings to mind why else I think you are a unique and very valuable guest because you have a bird's eye view, it seems, of the whole situation. And I think it's quite difficult for people to get a bird's eye view, to have a historical context, to have context around uh, all these different groups that you're talking about, to have context around the the law, the ethics around everything. And then I've even heard you speak in, about the process by which drugs are approved and the connections between, you know, lawmakers and drug companies and et cetera. So I, I aspire to kind of really see the big picture in the way that I think you're capable of seeing it. And I think you're going to help me see that big picture. I would, I would love to. This is, um, in fact, as my work has progressed and as time has passed and I've grown older, I, I feel that I'm looking but the the portrait that I'm drawing or that is that I see is 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 higher and higher level in the sense that I'm a bit more distant from the um the objects and the, the activities on the ground, both in space and time, meaning the the I'm very interested in how we were doing things sixty thousand years ago is what I mean. I mean we We've been in groups for a long time. We've had to collaborate and cooperate. We've excluded and included. We've had rituals around that. I'm sure for 100,000 years, if not more, we are only looking at ourselves over the last 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm conscious that a lot of things have gone on before. A lot of things will go on after. But I do try to get what I call the big picture. Yes. And it makes me pay attention to some patterns and completely ignore others mm. that some of us might be caught up in. Mm. They, they're almost meaningless to me, but that might be illustrated as we continue discussing. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about that, about that comment, the patterns that you find yourself ignoring. And is that, I mean, can you give an example of what you mean by that? You know, it doesn't really matter, for example, you said, um, it, it doesn't quite matter the nature of the, the, the interventions, whether you're drugging someone or, or recommending them to take a drug or giving them a drug or putting it in their mouth or just talking with them. It doesn't quite matter sometimes the nature of the drug. It doesn't matter where you're, whether you're doing it in a mean way or a kind way or you mean well or you want to punish them or Ultimately, everything has an effect. And um, and what people decide the effect is for them is often what it's going to be. There's a lot of constructionism uh, in, in treatments. What is an effective treatment is not really something very objective when you're talking about influencing behavior. Even to some extent when you're talking about changing bodies 
and meeting targets to say reduce a cancer. That is something that's, you know, you could say objectively measurable. I don't need to know your personality to know that the drug is having an effect, let's say. But for everything that has to do with me influencing how you feel and you think and you act, almost anything goes. Mm. Uh, the dynamics that work there are things that we just don't get. We just know that if you're seeking or willing and you get some palpable feeling in your body about something I've given you, there's going to be an effect. And you're going to decide what the effect's going to be to a great extent. So I mean to say that it doesn't quite matter sometimes the exact circumstances within which something is taking place. We're going to throw in meaning at it on all sides, and someone's going to come out of it with their own meaning, and it's going to have the effect they've wanted it to have, or the effect they have never wanted it to have. So what I'm saying is, it's hard to really understand exactly what's going on. Mm. in healing relationships. We just know that they're malleable, they're powerful, and they're like a constant. Mm. What exactly the different forms they take are almost irrelevant. There's like this constant invariant connection and, you know, good luck to understand how it works. But something happens and it gets used by charlatans, by experts, by well-meaning people, by by people themselves over and over again in the past and will get used in the future. Interesting. Hmm. Well, I would love for you to perhaps articulate what you see is the modern day mental health care system, um, particularly as provided by professional psychiatrists, if you could articulate how you see that system as functioning and what maybe some of the core beliefs are that that underlie it, if, if you could articulate that and then express to me, what do you believe are some of the core problems with modern day mental health care? Okay. Okay, okay. Well, that's that's a good, good, I guess, way to start the core beliefs, the core and the core problems with those beliefs. Mm. Let me just start by something that came came on my desk. Um, it's an article. It's a big review article in the journal Neuron. Neuron is a nature publication. It's a maybe one of the most prestigious um biological neurobiology publications in the in the world and um i think it came out august 17th i wrote down a couple of lines from it so it's a review by raymond dolan he is considered one of the you know most cited top second or third or fourth most cited neuroscientists in the world and he and his colleagues wrote a review of a massive amount of brain imaging neuroimaging literature. He says they looked at 16,000 articles that were published in the last 30 years. It's a huge body of knowledge looking for the underlying neurobiological basis of psychiatric conditions. So I would love to read to you the conclusion, a couple of passages. I think it's going to tell us what are the core beliefs and what are the core problems. Mm -hmm. He writes, despite three decades of intense neuroimaging research, we still lack a neurobiological account for any psychiatric condition. He continues, thus, it remains difficult to refute a critique that psychiatry's most fundamental characteristic is its ignorance. Mm -hmm. that it cannot successfully define the object of its attention, while its attempts to lay bare the etiology of its disorders have been a litany of failures, unquote. So that's not me saying that. I agree with that 100%. That's Raymond Dolan in Neuron. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks before, we had the review by Joanna Moncrief and her colleagues. I believe Joanna has been on your show, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. She published her review 
a systematic review of the six or seven different lines of research pertaining to the association between the neurotransmitter serotonin and the condition that's called major depressive disorder. And she concludes that there is no consistent evidence of any kind of association or causal connection between serotonin and between major depression. So that's the one first core problem of psychiatry. It considers every human suffering that doesn't remit too easily as a biological problem, as a neurobiological problem, a brain disease. And this claim is continually contradicted by every review that looks at it. So essentially, psychiatry does not know what it's talking about. Or as Dolan would say, it remains difficult to refute the critique that psychiatry's most fundamental characteristic is its ignorance. It doesn't know what it's talking about, and its main claim to scientific legitimacy rests on an absence of the evidence that's needed to support those claims. Mm. So that's the first problem. Mm. It's scientifically empty. The second problem, which is also a paradigm of psychiatry in many ways, is that there is another kind of psychiatry, not one that's in the labs that does research. It's the psychiatry that's tasked with acting coercively. Mm. This is the psychiatry of coercion. This is the psychiatry where the psychiatrist is the agent of society, the agent of normality, the agent of the family, the agent of the court, the agent of the workplace, the agent of the foster care residence, the agent of the jails and the prisons, of the military, of the school, of the psychiatric hospital. And there, the psychiatrist specializes in the sort of psychopharmacological management of people that are deemed to be dangerous generally, people who have threatened or tried to commit suicide or threatened of some harm to themselves, less often others, but that too. And um, their psychiatry will use every means at its disposal to subdue that person, to quieten them. They'll hold them. They'll restrain them. They'll inject a drug in them to pacify them very quickly. They'll continue to drug them over days. They'll, um, and, you know, they'll do that because that person is deemed unpersuadable. And they'll do it until a person is less resistant, less loud, less hostile, more compliant. And it'll do it for enough time to then put the person back and get processed by the other parts of the system so that the person doesn't become too disruptive too soon. So that's another psychiatry. And when the psychiatrist in that second situation does that, the psychiatrist is also using a medical justification. The psychiatrist is, says, I'm treating a disease that has robbed this person. I'm treating a depression. I'm treating an obsession. I'm treating a psychosis that has robbed this person of their insight, just like a, just like a cancer has penetrated a, a body organ. But there is no basis for this explanation. But no one cares mm -hmm. because there they want order. They want stability. They want, please give us back the person we knew before this happened. They want peace. They want respite. They want to go to sleep. And the psychiatrist delivers. The psychiatrist delivers drawing on a two to 300 year old tradition of incarcerating people of doing just that with whatever means were at his or her disposal 100 years ago and 50 years ago and 200 years ago. And so the psychiatrist delivers there. And the problem, therefore, there is that let's connect it to the first problem that I mentioned, which is that scientifically it's empty. Again, it's, we're, we're seeing it in the journals as we speak. There is no neurobiological basis, as you're claiming, to any of the conditions 
that you say are brain diseases. The second problem is that society has accepted this scientific emptiness because psychiatry, a profession of trained medical practitioners, is willing to do the dirty work of taking care of the disruptors of morality and normality. And that's a big problem for society, which compounds the reckoning that psychiatry has to come to at some point. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've made some sense. We have a sort of a scientifically empty psychiatry that is never called to task, that's given a free pass for silly theories that are continually refuted by serious people who take the time to do to, to do that, to, to test them. And because the free pass is given, because psychiatry is willing to act coercively, and that is rampant, and we could discuss that. It's one of the areas of psychiatry that's the least documented, but it's very frequent. It's that underside. It's the underside. Mm. And we don't like to talk about it, but it holds everything together. Mm. Those are two of the problems that I see with psychiatry and that express some of its ideas. This notion that everything is a disease and must be treated like a disease and we're the doctors and that's what we're going to do. And then the fact that society holds everybody else uh, to, to have to follow that paradigm of treating everything as a disease, though it evidently is not a disease. <laughs> Whatever else it is, it is not a medical problem. But we're stuck with that. And it's really hard to get away from it. Brilliant. Wow. And <clears throat> as I was listening to you, I, I couldn't help but relate by thinking back to an experience I just had last week I have the opportunity to work in a jail but not not even not as a clinical psychologist but rather as an educator you know more and more there are educational programs being offered in jails and I'm very proud to work for an institution that partners with local jails and so anyway I was working with this group of people this group of females and and this woman told me her story and um her story involves basically, I don't know why exactly she was arrested. I don't know what her charge was, but she was arrested and then she was given a psych evaluation and she had been deemed incompetent. And that in itself was already shocking to me because this woman struck me as a lucid, emotionally stable, you know, bilingual, highly functional mother and person. And so, but I don't know what state she was in when she had the evaluation, but then interestingly, she brought documentation and the following week and showed me, and I read some of it and I saw the words that I've never seen written in an official document like this, but the words were um, involunt that, that she was being court ordered to undergo involuntary antipsychotic medication. And in addition to that, is being involuntarily uh, hospitalized. And this is apparently uh, the strategy that is going to bring her up to being competent so that she can stand trial. And this was, it felt heartbreaking to me, having gotten to know her a little bit, and it was shocking. And I just knew that it was just one example of, um, of a widespread phenomenon that, as you've pointed out, has been going on for centuries and is still going on today in a way that I think most people would never believe is going on. Like people, someone can force you to take a drug against your will if they have deemed that you are incompetent or insane. So I know you've done some work and even recently published a paper about psychiatric coercion. And I, I do want to get into that. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe we can go there now for a moment. So what, what can you tell us? What can you teach us about this phenomenon of, of psychiatric coercion? Maybe what some of the legalities are around this, 
how common it is, and what your opinion is about it. So it's an interesting uh, situation that you described to us about this uh, woman that you that you know and that you met to whom uh, this this happened. This involuntary these orders of involuntary treatment and and uh, detention or incarceration in the name of health, in the name of her mental health and her restoring her to competency. Um, you could say that to think a little bit about this more easily is to is to distinguish between these sorts of situations as they occur in the criminal justice system uh, and the, and the way they occur in the in the just in, in in civil society, if you will. So they're similar procedures, but they occur for slightly different reasons depending on the system in which you're being processed. In the example of the woman that you mentioned, she got arrested probably. So there was some kind of criminal charge in the making or in the offing somehow. She would be charged with something. And, and the, the tendency now, depending on what the charge is, is to say you can sort of have it easier. We're not going to punish you the way we normally would, which is to charge you and to try you and then to possibly incarcerate you. We're going to, you can have it easy by following these rules for a while and these rules are that you follow this treatment and if you do that you're not going to go through the whole process of a criminal justice procedure so that's one way and in the, the situation of her being found incompetent generally it would be in the situation she was found incompetent to stand trial I'm not sure, but I'm, it looks like this is what happened, right. which would mean specifically, generally, that means there are criteria for this, meaning how do you know if you're competent to stand trial? Well, one is you can converse with your lawyer. Uh, two is you understand what the charges are that are leveled against you, and you understand what could happen as a result of you being found guilty or innocent of those charges. If you understand that, you're competent to stand trial. Wow. So to the to what extent was that assessed? Or to what extent did we then say she's agitated or is not understanding what I'm saying to her in this assessment? To what extent was she legitimately there being assessed? Like who provoked this assessment of competency if one actually took place? But let's let's give the benefit of the doubt she was assessed for competency. But why was she assessed? What what triggered this? Was it some someone's idea that she really should be assessed bureaucratically? Or was it something that she really did? And and everybody wondered, is this person, you know, going to understand anything that's going on? Is this person uh, absolutely just totally dysfunctional? What? And so who knows? We, we, we might not know. It's not quite in the record. And the records speak for the records. They don't speak for, you know, understanding, really. You have to decipher them. That's why, you know, Foucault became famous, because he dove into the records and sort of dug in and created this archaeology to make words speak, um, to rewrite what was already written in a different order, to try to understand what was really going on. So the records don't say much unless you have the time to dig into them and excavate the different layers that are not obviously visible if you're not trained. So all this to say that coercion is a constant in, in the criminal justice system. We understand that, that that's a constant. And we say, to protect you from being abused in that situation, we're going to give you certain rights, like you're going to interrogate the witnesses. You have someone to help you and defend you, and and you can, you know, you 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 know what the charges are, kind of thing, etc. It's due process. We call it fair process. In the civil system, you may not be accused of anything. You ha you have committed no crime. That means you're innocent. It's not innocent until proven guilty. You're not guilty of anything. You're not charged with any with anything. But you're a nuisance. You're a problem. You are disrupting the order in some way. The order, which though it's implicit, it's a family order. It's a workplace order. That's just so powerful sometimes, more than breaking a law. Here you're doing something that where people are touched and hurt in their inner, but they can't quite say, except they feel terrible that this is happening because it's in their family or related to them or whatever it is. And so that touches deep and we have to act. But you're not in, guilty of anything. You're not accused of anything. You're just disrupting and, or you're suffering or you're making others suffer. But you're still innocent. So we have to still act in a way to, 
to, to change you, to modify what you do and solve the problem at least quickly, put you away somewhere else generally. And that's where psychiatry comes in. The methods would be the same, whatever tools at its disposal, drugs generally, or some kind of seclusion or holding you away from some place that you've disrupted that are, is used in both situations. But the pathways in, inside each are a little different. Mm. And so one measure is called forensic or criminal commitment. And that's what happened to your colleague or friend or, or person you knew. And the other is civil commitment, meaning it's outside of the criminal justice system. But police can are definitely still involved. You can call the police. And, and have someone, say, brought over to the emergency room or some psychiatric facility to be assessed. You don't need a judge to approve that. And once the facility sees you and sees you brought with the police and the police say, we were called because they were acting irresponsibly or someone was afraid they might do something wrong or hurt themselves, then they the place generally has an obligation to kind of keep you for a while. The tension is kind of increasing as far as you're concerned. You want to go home maybe. Then, then it leads to generally you being assessed either you're released for after a few hours or a couple of days or held until someone is satisfied, usually a physician, that you're not a threat to yourself. But it's kind of like proving that you're not, you know, it's like proving some absence of something. So it's, 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 a, it's a situation that's fraught with tension. You may be strip searched, you may be held for a while. If you're too loud, you may be tranquilized before we know anything that's going on. So you can just sort of imagine the kind of situation it is, often in a busy emergency room. And so that's commitment. That's called, that's the emergency hold. In California, last couple of years or so, about 100,000 people, according to the statistics from a number of counties, not all of whom give data, not all of whom give complete data, about 100,000 people that occur to in California, not necessarily very much, not necessarily very little. And then an unknown number kind of move on to a longer stay, depending on whether you agree to stay or you're released or you're forced to stay and then a judge gets involved. But all this is you're still, remember, you're detained. You can't leave. But you're not accused of anything except, I guess, of mental illness. So that's involuntary. That's the paradigmatic form of involuntary psychiatry. There are others. Guardianships. We might say, we need to take care of your affairs. You can no longer control your affairs. So we, we, we will take care of your money. We'll take care of your check. We'll take care of whatever you own and we'll make the decisions because you're irresponsible. Then it could be forced medication orders where we not, we're not going to use that. We, we go to court and we ask for a judge to to rule that if you refuse or what we're going to to, to what we want to give you as a drug, we can force it on you. So we have that threat. So in a way it's there. Sometimes it's 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 there to give it to you. Sometimes it's there if you say no, I don't want it. We'll say there is a court order. If you refuse, we can force it on you. So then you might say, okay, I'm not going to refuse it. Mm -hmm. So these situations, and then there's also forced electroshock, less in California, more in some other states. All of these practices are very poorly documented. And that's one of the things I try to do in the paper that you referred to, I published uh, 2021 early, was to try to count try to establish a count in the United States via state statistics, how many people were civilly committed in a couple in, a, in an index year. And so it's very hard to find those numbers. And, and when they exist, they're incomplete. So it's really an inequality here. Where we just don't know. We know that for criminal justice incarcerations. We don't know it for these civil incarcerations. Mm -hmm. We don't know it as much. I think it's a lot of people, but kind of estimating definitely over a million people a year are put in that situation. The figures speak only to maybe 500,000 in 20, uh, 600,000 in 25 states, uh, but the figures are wildly incomplete. So just to say, this is another part of psychiatry. Right. And more and more of it is happening in California. The governor just signed. Uh, assembly bill, I think 2098, if I'm not mistaken, which is called the care courts, which just, you know, authorizes more of these kinds of measures coming our way.
and and linked, I believe, to the failure of the system going along with the strict disease model paradigm to actually make a difference. Right. Because, you know, this has been the paradigm and we're doubling down on it by saying that there's some people who need it. We need to treat them and they don't know that they're sick. Sick. See, it's always the sickness idea. They are ill and we need more forced medical intervention. I mean, it could be forced. We'll give you money. We'll force you to accept our money. We want money in your pocket. Would you please take that money? You don't want the money. We'll force it on you. I think that I would say maybe that's okay. Maybe we wouldn't have involuntariness, but we're trying to force something else on them that they don't want. And that's why we have legislatures now expanding involuntary commitment and other forced measures as treatments in the name of health. It's very disturbing. Disturbs me. Yeah. I, I So... So you've described the psychiatrist in a lab conducting brain imaging studies, and you, you described that branch. You've described the psychiatrist who act as, you know, um, the way I'm interpreting it is kind of agents that serve the society by trying to maintain order by yes. forcefully incarcerating and treating anyone who is disrupting that order yes and then and then it, it it seems to me that there's also the group of psychiatrists who work with people who are i put air quotes around around the word willing to yes. receive this treatment and what what is so interesting to me about the people who are eager to go see a psychiatrist and glad to get a diagnosis and ready to take prescription drugs um to me it's like of course adults should be able to do whatever they want as long as it's not harming anyone else and, and that includes consuming psychoactive substances and at the same time though i believe that it is the responsibility of the prescriber to provide thoroughly informed consent and to me it's not just that a psychiatrist in that situation is often not providing enough information that this person needs in order to really consent. But on a broader cultural level, it, it strikes me that there's this phenomenon of manufacturing consent, almost similar, you know, like some people might be aware of <clears throat> what happened back in, I believe, the late 20s, 30s, right in there, when women never smoked cigarettes. And the tobacco companies were like, what are we doing? We're missing out on half our profits here. And so they consulted with who was Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, mm -hmm. about how can we get women to smoke? And so he set up, he staged this event and, and essentially created, a, 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 he reshaped the perception of women smoking cigarettes. It was no longer uh, a man's thing anymore, but it was a symbol of freedom and rebellion against the patriarchy for women and he staged this in a you know a specific way with influential women kind of dramatically lighting up a cigarette at an easter day parade um which was thoroughly documented and he had he had this phrase torches of freedom ready to go and and you literally see the numbers for women buying cigarettes immediately sharply increase after that so I raise this because I'm saying this, that was an example of kind of manufacturing consent. It was like, yes, women were consenting to smoke cigarettes, but they were doing so based on a false understanding of the true nature of cigarettes. And I'm drawing this connection here between that and what seems to be happening now, which is all of the commercials on TV in the United States, all of the narratives, all of the things that make people believe that fundamentally this drug is going to make me better. It's going to correct my chemical imbalance. It's going to enable me to be functional again. So of course, someone would be ready to consent to that if that's their understanding of what it is. But the problem is that's not what it really is. Um, that's my view. 
So I would just love to hear you kind of speak to that category of psychiatric practices where people are consenting to this often enthusiastically, but under false pretenses. Well, that's uh, okay. Okay, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, you're putting your finger on on some the key, some of the key issues, the key activities that need good examination. And the drug issue is, I mean, it's a complex one. The the drug issue, it, you know, we could really talk a couple of hours just on that one. It's really a fascination for me. But um, this is another issue where there is, in many ways, a lot of scientific emptiness, the psychiatric drug issue. Um, in the sense that that the discourse has been in, in, in not recently, really, in about 60 years now, since the late 50s, since the arrival of, you know, Thorazine and, and the similar antipsychotics in the insane asylums. But since around that time, with that the benzodiazepines, Valium arriving on the market in 1961, and the stimulants already haven't been around for 30 years before that. There's there's already a mass market of these licit pres- prescribed on prescription available over the counter, but medically, medically disposed sorts of substances, medically surrounded uh, to tranquilize you and change your behavior. In addition to the marijuana and the cocaine and the alcohol that's already drowning the society already. So America and most other countries are massive drug cultures, right. isn't it? You know, and, and, and you could look at the world and just see that the different areas, different spheres of influence of different dr- drugs, you know, coffee and cot and alcohol. And it's just the globe is soaked mm. in drugs. So we need to accept that as a baseline. Mm. And then we start looking at specific cultures and who comes in and sort of captures the culture of drugs and turns it around to their advantage. And what is it that they're selling the public? And what the American psychiatric drug culture overall has sold the public, probably one of the things is that there's something wrong with you and you need this drug. I think that's where the, 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 the American psychiatric drug culture has been very successful. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with your brain. There's something deficient in you and this drug will fix it. There's this imbalance, neurochemical, chemical, whatever. And and, and here's the drug that's going to correct it. So it sold the drugs as these these guided missiles at 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 the neurotransmitters of our discontent, you know, to be poetic. And that's what it was kind of selling. But um, except that, that's not what they are, really. They're just psychoactive drugs. That means that um, simply, you know, there's no aberrant neuropathology or neurophysiology that's being fixed. There's a drug that's creating apathy and or it's creating sedation and tranquility so that uh, and it takes care of your sleeplessness and your worry so you can sleep at night and there is a drug that's um making you apathetic and in fact even putting you into kind of a stupor and actually it's helping you a little bit with your paranoia or your uh, your psychosis if you will and there is a drug that will uh, uh, keep you up make you more wakeful makes you more wakeful and excited so you can um, get through that that boring work, if you know what I mean. So the thing is, the drugs are are adding effects that are that are smothering, that are papering over your existing state. They're not fixing anything. They're certainly affecting your brain, but they're adding their effect on your brain. And and their effects are psychoactive effects. They're global, emotional, physical, psychological states that you can't quite, you know, what is sedation? Is it psychological or is it physical? It's it, it's both. It's everything. It's a your 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 muscles are more relaxed and heavy at the same time you don't really want to think or pay attention. And so it's a global state and it's like a psychoactive state. And that's what the drugs seem to trigger. And so, surprise, um, we, 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 we took these drugs and um, it was hard to stop taking them. 
surprise, you know, and then, but also we wanted more. Could I please have that? Actually, that, that made a difference. I like that. I like that stupor. I like that wakefulness. I like that slumber. I like that indifference and emotional numbing and difficulty even thinking. I like that actually it gets me through that paranoia or that agitation. So in fact, that's what the drugs are doing. They were not necessarily fixing any physiology in you or making you healthier. They were drugging you. The drugs are drugging you. And for different reasons, you might feel, I like that, I appreciate that, or this leaves me completely indifferent, I don't think this helps me, or this is terrible, this is the worst thing I've tried, this is giving me movement disorders, and this is giving me uh, uh, liver problems, and this is, you know, blocking my pee, and this is, you know, I, I can't have sex with this. That's also what happens, new problems for which there are new drugs. But that's really another piece of emptiness there that the drugs are not these magic, marvelous products of pharmaceutical science. They are identical to the other drugs on the other side of the wall that we're pointing to, pointing to and saying, don't take those drugs. Those drugs are bad for you. Take these drugs. So it's, it, they're really the same. So it's, is it um, Adderall, amphetamine that's on prescription, or is it cocaine that is a terrible drug with no medical use? Mm. Is it uh, benzodiazepines that'll put you to sleep, or is it just, just alcohol? They're the same drugs with the same effects. Mm. Is it uh, you know the, the, the sleepfulness and the slumber of opiates, or is it that low-dose antipsychotic that we can give you? They're the same kind of drugs with the same prototypical effect but some have had the bad luck to be born elsewhere. Mm. There are other drugs, they're foreign drugs. They're not here long enough. And others, we make them here, we give them our names. They're our drugs. And so that's really what it's all about. It's not about your physiology. It's not about chemical imbalances. It's about the imbalances they're creating. It's about the disruption they're having. It's about the difficulty you have stopping them. So they're all psychoactive drugs. You've been fooled again. But, of course, you can find them useful. The question, therefore, is, well, how should you use them? And um, who should control your use of them? And if you're now given this information that it's the effects of the drug that will have an effect on you, it's the psychoactive effect that makes them powerful that they are, then you might decide whether to take them, when to take them, how to take them, how to stop them, how long to take them, much differently than if you just prescribe something that's a marvel of medicine and told, just take that until we work out whether it's working. So I think that that's the issue, the way I like to frame it, that they all fit in the same basket. They're all psychoactives. Some are holier, some, some are, you know, holy drugs and some are demon drugs, if you will. Some are demonized, some are canonized, to use those words. And it really comes down to that. But they're the same characters. They're the same unsavory characters mm. on either side of the, of the divide. The divide is linguistic, semantic, cultural, legal. Mm. It's not pharmacological. Mm. So it opens up our relation to the drugs um, to, to, you know, it puts it in a different perspective. Uh, and that's why when, when the, the, the recently last month that uh, serotonin review came out and when, you know, I mean, media has picked up that story in a tremendous way. I was quite astonished at first. I said, well, people shouldn't be surprised. That's been the evidence forever, but no, it's like people were, it's like people were told, it, but that's not what we were told. It, it's, you know, the fact that so many, you know, so many media stories came out of, there is no link between serotonin and depression. It means that people believe there was a link. This was very newsworthy. Right. And they believe it means that's what they were sold. Right. And probably that's the basis on which they thought they were taking it. Right. I should take it because this is a medical issue. Exactly. There's something wrong with my brain, a, a balance of imbalance of a chemical that's being fixed by this drug. Well, that is another empty story. As we found out, there is no neurobiological explanation for any condition. 
So you see, this is the, this, it's all related. It's all pretty depressing when you think about it. It is a kind of a house of cards. And so, you know, but it holds in many ways, it's a runaway success. Mm. People kind of seem to want more. Give me more of these diagnoses. They, there's a lot. And, and with the drugs too, some of the, some of the basic truths about drugs get, get, get forgotten when we look at them medically. One thing is people use drugs when they're very, very happy and when they're very, very sad. They are drawn to drugs, psychoactive drugs. They're drawn to drugs when they're alone and they're drawn to drugs when they're in a crowd. Mm. These are like simple constants that I feel I have observed over, you know, few decades of study. Drugs in different countries and societies and time periods mm. and in our modern period. Mm. These are these constants. When you have a good time, you might want to be on a drug. And when you have the worst time in your life, you might want to be on the drug. These are some of the basics that get sort of hijacked by the by the drug sellers, whether they're licit or illicit, whether they're in white coats or on the street corner. Right. These these, these constants that people observe and that are true about psychoactives get hijacked get you know appropriated and then resold as this is the truth of why you need to take this drug given to you by me so so that's that's the when i was saying i some things are not important to me it's not important often what meaning a person will give to something but it's important to know that people are drawn to drugs it's a constant we're not going to get rid of them and you know that the as we speak, the psychedelics, the hallucinogens, psilocybin, LSD, uh, DMT, ayahuasca, whatever, which were the epitome of irresponsible, non-medical, dangerous use of drugs, are now the new dawn in the field. Mm. Everywhere. California especially. Mm. And so that, again, these, these are value reversals. They're there's a dozen of them going on constantly, some slower than others, but that's the history of drugs. They go through these phases and they become completely demonized and then they become canonized again. So as a, as a person with a conscience, your duty, and I mean a, a citizen's duty, is really to be, this is where, where it calls for critical thinking. Yes. That's what is called of you. Is, is, is to be a critical thinker, not to just like get caught in the current and say, wow, let's see what psilocybin can do for my PTSD. It's, it's, it might do something for you. It will do something. Mm -hmm. There's no question. But the point is, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing with it? What is this relationship you're going to have and you're going to cultivate? And is this what you want to be doing? Mm -hmm. And that is, comes from critical thinking and from looking at history stuff like that, which is what I try to teach. See, a lot of history, I think, makes a difference because, uh, because it tells you that the past was once the present. And at that present, people thought, hey, I finally found exactly what eluded you know, my predecessors. And I'm paraphrasing something by a quote by uh, C.S. Lewis, mm. I've admired for a long time. And so, so it's, it, by looking at history, your present, your moment, in my view, is put in some context. It's one way for us to step out and look at the big picture, is to look at the history of this idea, of this intervention, of this product that you're considering making part of your present. Mm. Where is it coming from? Mm. <clears throat> Gosh. When you, when you talk about you know, like the, the example of psilocybin that I like that phrase you use, the value reversal. That's fascinating. And um, I'm sure that there are many instances of value reversals around some one product or another, whether it be drugs or anything else. Yes. Um, 
it strikes me that what is happening with psychiatric drugs is a bit different in that it's based on a lie. And what's so interesting too is that I know many of those, uh, many drug dealers, like I said, working in the jail, many of the people in this jail that I work at are in there on drug sales charges. And so I have picked their brains extensively about how they think about it, you know? And what I find to be so interesting is that sometimes they strike me as more ethical than a prescribing physician of psychiatric drugs. They, I know most methamphetamine dealers that I know would never sell methamphetamine to a child or even a teenager. And they will cut someone off if they're getting way too obsessed and their life is spiraling out of control. Now, granted, that's just some, that's a small sample of people, of course. And that, because the other, the other problem, if I may add, when you create this very arbitrary legal wall between chemicals and chemicals that are essentially the same, you do create a, you create criminal activity and you create a complete lack of regulation over the quality of the drug that is illegal. And so now the one thing that let's say Adderall might have over methamphetamine on the street is it's not cut with anything. It's it's far, it's, it's far, it's purity. Exactly. And so that's, that's important. And, 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 you don't know what you're getting on the street sometimes, and, and that's a big problem. But other than that, let's assume you're getting something pure on the street. It's I think it's important for people to really check with themselves about the difference in their own perception between illicit drugs and prescribed psychiatric drugs. And an ex a simple thought experiment is, what if I said to you, my child, who tends to be quite emotional sometimes, I, you know, I decided that I would just let him smoke a little weed every night, or I decided that I would give him just like one shot of Jack Daniels before bed so he calms down. What if I said that? What would be your gut reaction to that? It would probably be uh, shock and, you know, you would be in disbelief about this, right? You would think so poorly of me as a parent. But then if I said that my, the same things and, and, and I just replaced weed and alcohol with some sedative that was prescribed by a doctor then people have a very different reaction it's it's they might not even think twice about it they might even think oh good for you for finding the treatment that your kid needed but that to me that little thought experiment and the differences between those perceptions and those reactions exposes the profound difference between how these drugs are perceived and, and and it exposes the fact that again there's this entire cultural narrative that has shaped that perception and that whole narrative is empty of any kind of validity whatsoever I think it's well said. It's well said. It's a good example. Uh, it's a good example. I've used the example of just just giving coffee to your child, mm. just having your child drink coffee, compared to having your child take a a you know high grade amphetamine drug, you know every morning, and uh, and I've asked that you know I've, I've asked that question for for several years of lots of people, and I'm I'm like you I'm I'm stunned to see the the responses and so forth, and so. It is. You're right. It, it's just there's, you know, if you get that, then you know that there's a lot of um, cultural scripts and um, around drugs, and you know that it's very easy. They're they're very charged objects, and um, it's very easy to project things onto them, and it's very easy for for us. The the they create meaning. You know, the drugs. They're like um, when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're. That's what I, I was referring to in a way. It's why do we want to go for these things? So it's easy to project things onto the drugs. And especially when the drugs are given to you by a very trusted um, um, uh, figure, the physician. So the physician giving you the drug and the physician telling you that this is really going to do wonders for the, in this situation or this could help. 
goes a long way for you to see the same product lying on the same table, this inner thing that's just there. Uh, it has no identity except just what was pronounced about it. And that could just completely alter its nature for you well, so that you're now giving it to your child. Well, that you wouldn't right. even, you know, expose to a draft or something like that. Right. All of a sudden they are taking in their body sometimes for weeks, months, or years a product that whose consequences are basically unknown. Um, just with my PhD student, we've just completed a, a, a long, large-scale study of adverse effects in children. And I don't want to say much about it, but it is really eye-opening of uh, the kinds of issues that could really come up when children are exposed to drugs for a long time. Mm. And um, so, so yeah, there's it, 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 it's a minefield. This drug thing is a minefield. It's um, and and it takes an unusually um, a cautious, careful, lucky person not to get taken in uh, by the latest slogans and right. the, the people with with powerful interests behind them. It re you you really have to keep your cool. And the psychedelics, I mean, the things we'll see. Maybe they're out there already, but we will see serious discussions of how to be giving LSD and everything to children. We will be seeing that. It will be on TV. It will be in the newspapers. I guarantee it. It's just it's just a matter of time. Maybe it's happening now. I've seen maybe on on administering cannabis to children. You know, how do parents? In other words, once you accept that it's good, and once you accept that it's good for some people, then the question some person says, well, why isn't it good for everybody? And then why isn't it good for children? And then that that's always the the the, the pattern. So we will be discussing that. How do we give it to them? How do we microdose, you know, psychedelics with with uh, two year olds and maybe even pre fetally in the in the fetus? Pre-birth. These are not unreasonable uh, questions to ask. As soon as you pass that, you move into that land where you're guided by the hand, by a you know dealer. Mm. <laughs> so, so it's it's a complex thing. But when we're brought back to the psychiatric issue, there's the simple issue of consent, and there's a bit of a word twist. When you said we want the psychiatrist to provide informed consent. Informed consent is not provided by the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist obtains informed consent. The person gives or refuses consent. So it's the person to give or refuse, not necessarily to consent automatically. They that by definition to be informed means to be informed so that you can refuse, not so that you automatically say yes, right. because hey, you don't want it, not for you. So right. We provide, the, the professional provides the conditions and the information and response to the answers in a process, in your language, in your understanding over time, that you, that those conditions allow you to make an informed choice mm -hmm. about whether to take or not to take that drug or that treatment. So that's what it's about. That, the extent to which that's just, that works in practice it's, it's, again, that is also complex, how it works, why we tend to overlook it, or we tend to say, let's not bring it up now, this is not the time, why there's a kind of a, you know, kind of a collusion, you know, people are not quite showing themselves, you know, that kabuki theater where at some point, I'm wearing a mask, you're wearing a mask, you're talking without your mask as I'm putting mine on, and we're not quite sure who's saying what, and that is, the situation is charged, and it's quick. It, you know, at some point, we both have to leave and a decision has to be made, usually around a drug, especially when it's a psychiatric situation, because there's nothing else to do. It's either I give you a drug or you go home. Right. I'm not going to give you money. I'm not going to be your best friend. I'm not going to give you a job. I'll give you a drug or not. And we have X minutes to make that decision. So it's all geared to that end. Whether you know it or not, want it or not, discuss it or not, it's going to come down to that. So the consent around it the understanding of what you're getting into, the withdrawal effects, how long should you take it, all these things, um, they're not quite necessarily raised. Uh, and so the charisma of the physician plays a lot. And therefore, all the, you know, the amplification of placebo effects and your expectations and, and so on. So this is why the, the drug issue, it's endless. And it's fascinating for me 
as a student of of the, these situations, these prescription situations, it's it's just full of every possible dynamic you can you can think of, both you know actual behaviors and hopes and feelings and longings, and uh, projections and you know guesses and mind reading and so forth uh, around this object. Um, it's it's very interesting. So you got to be careful. You, you got to wade into this very cautiously and you need to take your time. And um, the drugs have not worked according to the goals we had for them. It's been pronounced, it's said by the biggest voices in the field, the most traditional orthodox voices have said that the, the 60 years of the so-called psychopharmacological revolution have produced nowhere near what we thought they would, and they have produced much more harm, most of which we haven't even measured. So you need to be careful. When someone talks in a very excited way about the new drugs coming of this, just that's the time to step back and you know, put on your thinking cap, because we've been at this for 60 years. There's nothing new. We've been at it. We've been around the block 10 times. So let's be very careful here. Uh, despite massive increases, doubling and tripling of rates to kids or so forth, we don't have any measures of improvement at a population level. We're worse off than most countries, most developed countries in the world. So the drugs, if anything, do not seem to have added an advantage in America. So we have to be very careful. Maybe when one looks at an individual situation, you can see some kind of improvement, but you know, multiplied by millions of times, <laughs> does not look good, whether for adults or for people with depression, we have a lot of anecdotes, but we're supposed to be evidence-based, I understand. Although we can see now, we are not evidence-based in any way, shape, or form in this field. So so that's just a slogan that's used to just keep things as they are. Right. So in the drug thing, be careful. Um, be careful. It's wise counsel. And th yeah, thank you for catching the word twist there. I did say that a physician provides informed consent, but no, they provide information. That's right, information. Informed. You did say that too. You did say that too. <laughs> but no, you, it's a good clarification. You, the, the one being prescribed is the one who can consent, but you also cannot consent. I think that's Absolutely. important to just highlight, right? Because people yeah, that's what it means. Of, yeah, and we've got, almost got to the point where people, they almost forget that, they don't have to consent here. Consent means not having to consent. Exactly. Otherwise, there is no consent. Exactly, exactly. So it's just uh, one of those words that is key to understand what we're doing here. And and uh, uh, but you know, uh, we could, like I said, we could go on talking about this this drug topic for for forever and still right. not exhaust uh, much of it. And I think I feel you know, kind of satisfied with the way that we have talked about it and just just clarified to people who, who may not have been aware of the fact that they are simply psychoactive substances. The only, I mean, of the many differences, not in the nature of the chem chemicals or the of the effect, but in just the culture around it and the business around it is that these particular psychoactive substances have some of the most large, powerful corporation money interests yes. fueling their yes. use. Yes. And so that that makes it very scary. And to me, one of the most, one of the scariest things I look at is I look at sales projections um, that these companies put out mm -hmm. for their drugs in the mm -hmm. upcoming years. And as anyone might guess, they are projected to increase in sales year by year by year for many years to come yes. and i i hope that doesn't happen i'm just a little person over here with the hope but i hope that does not happen i hope these drug companies begin to lose money and they have to pivot and find a way to actually be helpful um it goes through cycles Definitely, it goes through cycles. So it's not been uh, constant growth always, but uh, the, the, at least the commercial, you know, pharmaceutical market of the psychoactives. Um, but uh, it uh, it goes through cycles, ups and downs, and and the 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 markets themselves, meaning the 
the targets, like you were talking about the women, you know, becoming a market, just like children became a market about 35, 40 years ago. They were never a market before, except right. they were always under 1% of kids who were on some kind of psychoactive, usually benzodiazepine, a tranquilizer to go to bed at night. Now it's about 12% of kids. So that's, that's, that's a lot of kids. Uh, it's about one in five adults. So one in five adults in America, probably depending on the age group, older kids more than younger kids. But I'm just trying to put some quick numbers, but I would say no, it's a, it's about one in nine, one in eight kids overall, like from zero to 18, although it could be one in five from 16 to uh, to 22 or something, you know, but mm. one in eight, one in nine, uh, maybe even, and that's for kids. For adults, I think we're around, we're getting close to one in four. Certainly when you bring in the opiates, mm. and, which were always kind of pushed aside, but they are prototypical psychotropic mm. drugs. I mean, the psychoactive, they're, they're the, you know, the master psychoactive drug after alcohol is, is opium. And there's no question about it mm. as a painkiller, as a, as a sleep inducer, as all kinds of things. It's, it's incredible. And the difference between opium and let's say um, um, Zyprexa or Risperdal or which antipsychotics um, is that opium has been around much longer. And uh, we know much more about opium than, than we know about the antipsychotic drugs, I dare say, which is that the the advantage a lot of the illicit drugs, the older drugs have is they're older. They're two, three, four thousand years old. They have a huge history of use. Yeah. And actually there are many cultures of how to use them. Whereas um, most of the drugs we're using now in America to change our behavior are 50 years old, 60, 70 years old. So in a way, there's just that aspect of it. It doesn't mean that we know everything about a drug because we've had it around for 5,000 years. But I feel that in many ways, some of these illicit drugs are actually safer. They're actually safer in their traditional way of using. They're safer than the prescribed drugs. Not necessarily all of them. It's how you use them. It's how much you use. But if I had to make a generalization, I would say opium is much sa more safer than um, than Risperdal or Thorazine or Zyprexa or uh, or uh, Seroquel for some brand names of some drugs to to really uh, stun you. Mm -hmm. No question that opium would have to be safe. It's just the dry juice of the poppy. Mm. So um, you know, I'm I'm saying that not to be sensational. I'm just saying that that when you look at it. Um, you know what is the devil in the drug that you, you know, that's on this side, whereas that newer drug, well, it's really new. It's just been studied on 3,000 people, and we broke all our rules during the clinical trials anyways. So, and I can tell you a lot about that if you want. So I'm not inclined to trust that drug rather than to trust that older drug. Right. Well, so, let's go there. I wanted to ask you that about I don't think a lot of people have clarity on exactly how drugs are approved of by the FDA, how they hit the market, what that looks like, and what type of rules have been broken in that process. So can you can you take us through that? I know it's a lot, but perhaps you could summarize what that process looks like. I'm gonna, you know, by I, I, I'm gonna make take a great risk to say for maybe the first time that it is a heck of a topic. Um I, I recommend a few books, probably. I would recommend books. I think I would look at a couple of books by David Healy, H-E-A-L-Y, David Healy. He's a, um, a Welsh, a British psychiatrist, and who's now uh, in, um, in Ontario at a university in Ontario, a very well-known fellow who um, has a good understanding of how the drugs are tested and, and approved, and especially the kind of information that you do not get that comes out of the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. The fact that we still do not have access, full access to the data from the clinical trials of drugs that are conducted to, to present the results to the FDA, which will decide whether the drug is safe and effective for a particular indication. So the process, it's a long process with different phases of trials for a few years. It's not as complicated as it's as it's presented often. And, and drug companies say it costs now two billion dollars just to bring one drug to market. But half of that money at least is just loss on investments and, and things like that. It's 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 accounting counting. It's not real money. And it's just like, you know, lost opportunities and things like that. But the profits are tremendous. So they want to make you think that we're investing so much. Of course, we're gonna, you know, milk the hell out of it once we have it. Everything is about a patent. 
while the drug's under patent, you as a maker can now sell it, market it, and only for that period. But that period, all you got is 20 years, and much of that, the drug is being tested. And so then you've only got four, five, six, seven years on the market. And so that's why the drug is in the air. That's why people are talking about it. That's why it's being prescribed, because it's under patent. And the maker has to maximize how much money they can make out of that drug in those five, six, seven years. And so it it just pushes it on the system through every possible strategy, legal and so often illegal, um, to, to get people to pay attention to it, get doctors to prescribe it, get patients to take it, get patient groups to, to praise it, get, get it in the news, get it in the in the waves, get it in the air, get it in the bodies and flowing in the veins. And so that is where it's happening. Why? It's under patent. And so that's when the money can be made. So that explains almost everything about why is Trintelix or whatever it is, a new antidepressant, never heard of that drug before. Why is all of a sudden number one? What, what, what happened? What was wrong with the other ones? Or people don't even know. Why are they prescribing it so much now? It's a new drug. Like what? It's under patent. Money has to be made. All the forces, the Edward Bernays forces, are deployed to get, to squeeze out everything you can from that product during those few years. So it's this is the kind of stuff that you need to understand. You think, oh, your doctor is now thinking that this is quite right for you now because they've sort of fairly um, you know, evaluated your situation and your interests, maybe. Maybe the drug company has fairly evaluated how your doctor could be orchestrated to do exactly that in a really fine-tuned campaign that's costing them only a fifth of what the profits are going to make from that drug in one year. So it's that's that's my way of kind of cutting through the whole thing. Yes. The FDA approval is a is an obstacle course, not so complicated nowadays. And um to get a drug to market because once it's on the market, it can run wild for a few years. And the problems it will cause and the lawsuits that will be part of the price of doing business. Mm. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. I apologize because I don't think I've quite clarified things, and I've said some some things that, without more background, might might be taken, you know, out of out of the background, I guess. But um, but it is it is a long topic, really. It really is the, the drug approval and the clinical trials and the twists and the turns, and and who does these trials and um, why they why the the sponsor of the trials invest in them because they need results. They need to get that drug through that obstacle course. And um and 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 that that's the business. The business must go on. Um so so you we we've got that psychoactive you know problem that we're not quite we're misled a little bit on the nature of the drugs. And then we're a little bit misled on why they're out there. Yeah. and given out so easily right um we're a little bit misled on that and and um it, it is it's it's doing business in right. it's inter, you know international business it, mm. it it's about the welfare of countries too it's a, it's about the economic interests of countries and the investments that huge funds make into into safe returns and so forth it's kind of all connected Mm. And so they're very happy and, and at very high levels, we want a certain drug maker, Pfizer or, or Novartis or whatever, to succeed. I'd like to ask you one more question, if you have time for it. I do. I do, actually. Awesome. So I, I'm, I feel extremely interested in knowing what types of conversations and interactions you've had with your colleagues in the UCLA Psychiatry Center. Um, I know like much of what you've said, even in today's conversation, must challenge much of what they may believe uh, and how they practice. And so I'm curious to know, do you find yourself debating these topics? Am I wrong in thinking that 
the UCLA psychiatrists would feel challenged by this? What types of reactions do they have to these enormous meta-analyses that demonstrate the scientific emptiness of psychiatry? These are my questions. Great questions, uh, you know, how to put your, your finger on some buttons. So, you know, I've been at UCLA just 10 years. I, 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 you know, it's kind of the end of my career in some way, so I've had it elsewhere. I must say that I, uh, I rarely debate these issues with colleagues at UCLA, very rarely. I've given a few conferences on, on topics I researched, you know, grand rounds, what they call them in the Department of Psychiatry, on, on research on the history of ECT and I've been invited by some uh, psychiatric residents who are very curious about, you know, uh, what is critical psychiatry, and 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 so um, I'm known as a critic, definitely. I think, but I rarely debate the debate. Um, it's not like the old days. I want to say there are a lot of things I'd like to say about that. It's an interesting question, actually. The the conversations. Um, are private. I avoid social media. It's just something that is not for me. So the conversations are private. Uh, they're usually around a dissertation defense or something for someone defending a dissertation. And there's some colleagues, let's say um, a member of the committee is from the Department of Psychiatry, or so we might have a conversation and at that time, and it's more close in. And, and, um, and so these conversations are like they've always been. We quickly, quickly agree that psychiatry is in a deep, deep, big mess. But who wants to go to the end of their thinking? I don't mind. That's what I've been doing. You know, that's what I do. Uh, I think that's what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for my medical colleagues, the, the medical aura, the medical responsibility, and, and what I call the medical, the psychiatric heard thinking takes over and uh the conversation does not go too far after that um and you know i don't want to be one-sided in this you know i'm I, i'm part of that establishment i am at ucla you know whether i like it or not i'm known as a critic in a way that's the work i do but i'm still profiting from that system however i do want to say that I used to debate a lot. I used to debate all the time. I never refused an offer. I debated every possible group and, and in, in a, a dozen countries, parents and physicians. I've done many grand rounds in different, different hospitals. And I've debated all kinds of audiences and never shied away from it. But the debate today is different. This is a, a modern phenomenon. I think the debate takes place in blogs. It takes place in journals. It doesn't quite take place directly with the concerned individuals. They don't seem to talk to each other directly or have an opportunity for the public. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, who's going to debate in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA? Who's going to debate that there is no evidence for neurobiological basis of any psychiatric condition, quote unquote, as neuron said so, as molecular psychiatry just kind of concluded, who's going to debate that? How is the priest going to start criticizing the priesthood? It's, you know, you, man, we got to pay the mortgage. I mean, this is what it's about. So where is this going to lead to? You know what I mean? So it doesn't astonish me that there is not so much uh, debate. The critical ideas get kind of recycled into psychiatry on the side, if you will. Psychiatry sort of chomps on them, metabolizes them, and says, I'm dealing with the ideas, I'm dealing with the critique, but nothing quite changes. So there's that, that's a kind of, if you will, interaction that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the business model is keep the business going. Mm -hmm. That's what I call the tyranny of mental health, to give you the name of my next essay or book. It's really everything is called mental health or men mental illness, something or other. Yeah. It's just all about, it's meaningless. The legislatures, like I said, are imposing more coercion. The White House is out with its, its, its you know, White House drug control policy plan or so of 
just more treatment for the nation and and more of this and more drugs for f- more drugs to keep you from those drugs mm. the whole you know the incidence of the problems is happily pushing to 100% the whole country is turning into a kind of a psychiatric institution so what is it exactly that you want to debate it and who do you want to debate it with mm. Maybe those could be my final words for now. <laughs> it's a powerful note to end on. This, I, I just, I have to say, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to flatter you, but this has been a very impactful conversation for me, and I find you to be brilliant, knowledgeable, and also very kind. As a fellow kind man, it takes one to know one. <laughs> um, Nick, well, I'm I'm glad to uh, to meet a soulmate this way. Yes. But uh, first of all, thank you for these kind words, which uh, maybe not everyone who knows me might share, but that's that's the way it goes. I I, you know, I have a tendency sometimes to exaggerate the 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 depth or the breadth of the problem, but in a way, you question questions uh, did give me an opportunity. And like I told you before we started, I went to, I was looking at them just before I went to sleep and I know they were working Mm. night. I know I was working on them at night. Mm. And I think I found myself uh, today wanting to be a little more uh, direct about some issues. And the, um, the neuron review by uh, Raymond Dolan and colleagues, I've just not seen that kind of you know, straight talk from neuropsychologists and neuroscientists in a very long time. Like this is the straightest talk in the most prestigious, favorably disposed to neurobiology journal in the world, just saying it is empty. It is bare. There is no basis to the claims. So it is it's reinforcing yes yeah i'm so glad you brought that in i hadn't read that yet so it's the august 17th issue of neural just a scholarly you know bio 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 neural journal uh but um it's in the abstract it's in the beginning it's in the middle and it's in the conclusion the rest of it is is difficult to follow right but the plain english is is plain english Mm. it's it's unavoidable it has to be debated. This has been a gift to me, and I know I speak on behalf of the entire audience that it, it's been a gift to listen to you, really. I, I mean that, and <clears throat> I thank you for your time, and I'm grateful that we're connected now. Perhaps we Absolutely. will communicate again. Meanwhile, take care. Take care. Have a great weekend. You too.